There it is. I think I've got everything turned on. Technology is wonderful. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see you. We've got a good number here to join uh, Brian and welcoming everyone. Uh, doing some visitors. We're certainly glad that you're here. So, uh, just by way of disclaimer, uh, I uh, am one of uh, about what five or six guys that give lessons here and preach. So, uh, my name is Kevin, and, and uh, certainly uh, glad that everyone's here this morning. Um, so this morning we're going to look at uh, a part of the story of Moses, uh, and specifically we're going to be in Numbers chapter 20, and I think we have a history of not always doing this uh, account justice. Um, you know, we've talked in Bible classes uh, from time to time about exegesis and eisegesis, and uh, that, those are fancy words. Exegesis is just a, a fancy word that says that we, we take the text and we draw the meaning out of it. And eisegesis is a fancy word that says we kind of know what we think and so we're going to go prove it from the text. And that, and that really, uh, sometimes we don't do the best job with this story because we kind of think what we know and we go try to prove it from, from the text. And we do that with some other stories too. So I just want us to, to step back from it for a minute and let's look at it again. So we're going to be in Numbers 20, but before we, we get to that, let me, let me say this. Have you, have you ever heard the saying, uh, history has a way of repeating itself? I think we've all have heard that. We've probably all seen it and been a part of it. That's kind of what's going on here in Numbers chapter 20. Because in Numbers chapter 17, and for time's sake, we're not going to go there and look at it. But in, that, in Numbers chapter 17, we have a very similar thing going on here. God, through the prophet Moses, is leading people out of the, the promised land that he's, he's promised them. He's leading them out of Egypt, uh, where they had been in, in slavery. And leading them through the desert to the promised land. In number 17, they haven't made it to the promised land yet. And in fact, they find themselves in a desert. And they have nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And what happens? The people begin to gripe. The people begin to complain. They begin to moan. And they begin to attack Moses' leadership. And so God commands Moses. He says, Moses, in front of all the people... I want you to strike a rock. And out of that rock is going to come water. And the people can drink and the people will be able to survive. Because here they are in the desert with nothing to drink. And so that's exactly what happens back in Numbers chapter 17. The people are provided for. They have the water that they need. They're able to survive. They're satisfied. And they keep going along. So now you fast forward about, about 38 years later. Almost 40 years later. And that brings us to Numbers chapter 20. And... We have another generation of people. A lot of people have died, a lot of new people on the scene, but another generation of Israelites still wandering in the desert because their ancestors, their parents, didn't have the faith to get into the promised land. And this younger generation is there in the desert. Moses is still the leader. And what we're about to read in Numbers chapter 20 is history is about to repeat itself. Um, so Numbers chapter 20... I think my battery is about dead on this thing. Well, we may not have it on the screen, so I apologize. We're in Numbers chapter 20, uh, and we're starting in verse number 1. And it says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there, now, there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we have perished when our brothers perished before the Lord? Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, uh, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come out of Egypt and bring us to this evil place? Is there no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates? And there's no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went up from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. 
And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through him he showed himself holy. It's still on order. Okay, so let, let's discuss this passage. And as we're going to see, history is about to repeat itself. Sometimes we look at history and it makes us laugh, and sometimes we look at history and we get a little bit nostalgic. But here, with history, uh, what we see is that we see these people coming up against Moses again. Moses is probably having a little bit of deja vu. He's like, man, this, is, this happened 38 years ago. So we're going to deal with Moses here in a little bit. But I want us to start with the people. Let's think about these people for just a minute. These Israelites, what are they? They're complainers. They're whiners. <laughs> Have you ever been on a long uh, road trip with some kids? Uh, how long does it take before you start having problems? <laughs> it doesn't take very long, right? Because you just magnify that by a thousand times, and that's probably what Moses is going through. I mean, here we are 38 years later, and he's been hearing this constant whining and complaining and groaning and mumbling and attacking him. And, and so... We, we look back at the critique there in verse 3. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we have perished when our brothers perished before the Lord? Yeah, so what do they do? They start with the absolute most dramatic thing, right? We should just die. I mean, that's where they go. Have you, ever, have you ever been in an argument with somebody? Or maybe I should say a heated discussion. Um, and they want to drag up the past. Now, don't nudge the person sitting next to you. But some people do that, right? You have an argument with them, they, they, want to, they just want to drag up the past. And here are these people who are dragging up 38 years ago. Hey, we, we, should, have, we should have just died or, you know, back in, back in, in, in Egypt. Um, so look at what they do in verse 5. And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. There's no water to drink. So, so you see what they do. They go back four decades. And they said, back in Egypt, we had it better than we have it here. They, they pick something out of history and they throw it in Moses' face. They go dig it up. So what, what do we need to understand about these people? Now think about this. Think about these Israelites. What do we take from this? These people had a legitimate need, didn't they? They needed water. But they went about trying to satisfy that need in an illegitimate way. And they attack Moses. They attack his leadership. Now they have a need, but they're going about trying to satisfy that in an illegitimate way. They question what God was doing for Moses. Now, you know, maybe for some of us, that's a lesson that we really need to hear right now. Some of us might be like the Israelites. We have legitimate needs, but we go about trying to satisfy them in illegitimate ways. You know, the parent that's out of work and re really needs a job, that's a legitimate need. But to pad a resume and to lie in an interview, that's trying to meet that need in, a, in an illegitimate way. Maybe it's the student who really needs to make a good grade. That's a, that's a legitimate need. But they cheat, they cut corners to, to get that grade. It's an illegitimate way to get it. You know, we live in a very disconnected world right now. Now, we're more connected than ever with technology, right? But that's, that's part of why we're so disconnected to it, because we rely on technology, we don't rely on talking to each other. And so maybe it's a young person who has a legitimate need for community and a legitimate need for relationship. But they try to meet that need through partying or through uh, uncommitted relationships, those types of things. So what, what is it, with, what, what do we do with these kind of people? These folks, are, they're faithless, they're just as faithless as their, their ancestors were. They're complaining, they're grumbling. What does God do for them? God provides for them. That's our first picture of God's grace here in Numbers chapter 20. In the face of griping and complaining and whining, God gives his grace. God met their need. 
He gave them water. Now, everything I know about parenting says you don't reward bad behavior, right? And, and what we have to understand is God's not rewarding bad behavior. What, what we have to understand is God is providing for them despite their bad behavior. He's meeting their need. Why is He meeting their need in spite of their, compl of their complaining? Because He promised to. He said He would do it. He said, I'm not going to abandon you. He promised to take them to that land. He promised to stay with them. And what we see is in the face of their questioning and in the face of their faithlessness, in verse 11, water came out abundantly. God provided for the need. Now, some of us may need to hear that today. If you have faith in God, He is not going to give up on you. If you have faith in God, He's not going to abandon you. If you fall into sin, God's not going to leave you. He's still there. He still wants you. Maybe you find yourself in a generational cycle where grandma had a hot temper. And now I find myself having that same hot temper. Maybe, you know, that generational cycle like the Israelites are in. God's not abandoning you. God's not giving up on you. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, God knows it, and God's not giving up. Whatever desert you find yourself in, God's not giving up on you. He, he leads, forward, leads us forward. He tries to comfort us. He, but He uses his grace, his grace to meet us where we're at. Now, now, that doesn't mean that we're spared the consequences of our sin. Sometimes we have to bear the consequences of, of our sin. Uh, oftentimes we have to bear the consequences of our sin. But we can know that whatever desert we're in, God's there with us. You may be in Egypt right now, but if you have faith in God, He's not giving up on you. So these people in Numbers chapter 20, they're just as faithless as their parents were, but they got their water. They got what they needed. And not only that, by the end of the story, we're going to see that these people even got the promised land. Now, they didn't deserve the promised land, but they got the promised land. I think, I think it says 600,000 plus men. So when you add women and children, we're talking probably a couple of million people. Uh, did they deserve it? I mean, think about their behavior. Not really. <laughs> But that's our first picture, is how God responds to these people here. The first picture of grace that we have. Okay, now let's turn our attention to Moses. So we go back to the beginning of Numbers chapter 20. And it, it mentions there that Miriam died. So Miriam is not just some random member of the Israelite community. Mir Miriam is Moses' sister. Um, and so I think what, what's happening here is the, the writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is wanting to help us see that Moses is in a season of grief here. His sister has died. Uh, not only that, but the things are changing over the course of this generation. That you know, a lot of people that Moses was close to, no doubt, have died. Uh, but 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 for but things are changing for Moses in, in a painful way. His sister Miriam's dead. He's seen a lot of people die that he's been leading. He's grieving. He's hurt. Now you would think that the Israelites would cut him a little bit slack, right? Well, he's grieving. But that's not what they do. They go right at him. They cut it. They cut right into him. They criticize him. They attack him. Now, what does Moses initially? He doesn't react. He retreats. He goes before God. Now, I think there's a lesson there for us as well. When you look at the the when you when you're in the middle of being attacked unfairly, when you're in the middle of, of people griping and complaining at you, what's a good thing for you to do? Retreat. Let's go talk to God about it. And that's that's what we find Moses doing here. God, what should I do? Help me. How do I get through this situation? But when you look at the story of Moses in its entirety, one of the most striking things that you see is, is the intimacy that Moses shares with God. Uh, he's able to speak to God like man speaks to man. Uh, and so God meets with Moses, he meets with Aaron, and he gives them three specific commands. So let's look at them again, verse 30, verse 7. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff, Assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give them to drink to the congregation and their cattle. So this is very similar to what happened the generation before, 38 years before, right? Uh, the people are supposed to be gathered together, but this, guy, this time God tells Moses to speak to the rock, not to strike the rock. Okay, so there's three commands here, simple commands. Take the staff, gather the people, Speak to the rock. Take the staff, gather the people, speak to the rock. Why those three commands? Well, let's break those down for just a second. Why the staff? You know, what, what, what was important about the staff? So, so the, the staff was a stick that represents the presence of the Lord 
that Moses takes with him. It's not just a stick, it's a symbol. If you, you think back to, you know, it's a sign of God's power, it's a sign of God's authority. Uh, at, at one point, you know, Moses takes the staff and he puts it in the Nile River and it turns to blood and it's a sign of, of God's judgment on, on Egypt. As they're fleeing from the Egyptians, they come up on the Red Sea, uh, there's no escape for them. And Moses raises the staff and they, they pass through on, on dry ground. So God tells Moses to raise up the staff uh, and the waters part. They go through on dry ground. So, so when God sends Moses out here in Numbers chapter 20 with the staff, what is he doing? He's sending Moses out with the power and the authority of God. That's what the staff represents. It represents the, a symbol of the power and the authority of God. And basically what he's saying to Moses is he's saying, Moses, I want your confidence to be rooted in me. You're courageous and, and you are the one I've chosen to lead the people. And because I've chosen you, and I want the staff to be a reminder to the people that you are the leader, that you are the one speaking uh, for God. And so that's why he takes the staff. That's why they're supposed to gather all the people. You know, everyone's been criticizing Moses and Aaron. Everyone, every, God wants everyone to see that Moses is still my chosen leader here. The, Moses and Aaron are the ones that are leading, leading you. Okay, so then the third command is speak to the rock. So God wants the people to see that what is happening is happening because of Moses' obedience to God. So all of these commands are to support the leadership of Moses and, uh, and to let the people say, hey, Moses is still the one I've chosen. You're being critical of him. You're, you're attacking him. He's still, he's still the one that I've, I've chosen. So Moses has these three commands. Take the staff, gather the people, speak to the rock. And he gets two out of three right. He takes the staff, he gathers the people, but after that, what Moses does is not align with God at all. What we see is Moses rebels. He isn't faithful to what God told him to do. Now go back to verse 1. Remember, Miriam died. Is this pent up frustration and, and, it, and it's part of his season of grief that he's in? I don't know. You know, it's speculation, I guess. But I mean, maybe a, a little bit of a combination of all of it. Maybe it's just the, the weariness of, of the journey, the, the loss of his sister, the people attacking him. I mean, he, you can see where you could easily get very frustrated in that situation, right? Bottled up anger, bottled up frustration. Uh, but what he did was out of step with what God told him to do. Look at verse 11. Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. Now, Moses gets up in front of the people and he speaks, but he doesn't speak to the rock like he was told to. It was to the people. And what comes out of his mouth is just pure anger and frustration. And he's been dealing with these people for so long, and he just spews it out on them. Now, I'm going to remind you that Moses had a bit of an anger issue anyway. If you go back to, back in Egypt, uh, there's this fight that takes place, and Moses gets angry, and, and he ends up killing a guy. So I think Moses is, he's dealing with some of that anger issue that he's been dealing with his whole life. He's still, he's still got that. And, and in, the, in the face of this frustration of, of these people complaining, his anger gets the better of him once again. Now later in the Bible, one of the psalm writers is reflecting on this exact moment in history. And in Psalms chapter 106, verses 32 and 33, uh, it's talking about the waters of Meribah. He says, they angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter. He had a bitter spirit. And he spoke rashly. With his lips. Rash words come from Moses' lips. You know, words can be very vicious. Um, and undoubtedly, you've, you've experienced that. Maybe it was a, a boss that was not trying to help, but, but trying to inflict some pain on you. Or maybe it was an argument with a spouse or a parent or whoever. They, they had the opportunity to use their words constructively, and instead they lashed out at you. I've been guilty of lashing out at people with my words. We probably all have. But... 
you know, it, it wasn't meant to be constructed. It was, it was, he was venting. And Moses asked the question. He says, must we bring water from the rock? Now, that really wasn't a question, was it? That was more of a statement. What's he saying? You can't do anything right. I have to do everything for you. It sounds like a question, but that, the idea is more of a statement. Like He's, he's getting after him. Moses' words were meant to harm. They weren't, they weren't meant to bring healing. And so his anger and his, and he, used his mis, he, used, he misused his leadership to vent his anger. Now what does God do in response? Look at verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. Therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with this a little bit. Moses has been a faithful leader for decades for God. And over and over again we see Moses submitting to God's will. And, I, and Moses had a bad day, okay? And in one bad day, really, he, he's in a season of grief. He steps out of line with God. And, and, and in one bad day, this is his punishment. And I look at that initially and I go, man, that sounds kind of petty of God to treat Moses that way. What do we do with this? Well, for God, this isn't just the one thing that he did that wasn't the way that he told him to do it. What, what God is saying, he says, you didn't trust me enough. It isn't just about Moses' actions. It's about Moses' heart toward God. Trust. Trust is hard. Faith. I mean, faith is another word for trust. I'm putting it completely in your hands, God. Well, that's not what we see Moses do. It. You know, trust is an inward disposition, but it leads to outward actions. Moses didn't trust God. He didn't trust God to uphold him as holy in front of all the Israelites. So what does that mean? How did Moses not honor God? Now think back through those commands. Take the staff. So Moses has the symbol of God's power and God's authority. And he is standing in front of this congregation of people, this assembly of people. And he holds up this authority, uh, the symbol of God's authority. But what does he do? He acts under his own authority. He's not acting under God's authority. He's acting under his own authority. Now, Moses is a prophet of God. He's called a prophet many times. What does a prophet do? A prophet speaks God's word, Right? But what does Moses speak? He speaks, but he's not speaking God's words. He's speaking his own words. Moses says things that God never told him to say. He just vents his frustration, he vents his anger, and he turns himself into the judge over the people. And then, then Moses, he takes it a step further. He chooses his own way to bring about the water. God told him to speak to the rock. Moses hit the rock. It's, it's a matter of, it's outright disobedience. Moses essentially says, I'm taking the place of God here. I'm going to speak my own words as if they're God's words. And I'm going to bring this water out of this rock in my own way. And, and, and in, in those ways, Moses is trying to take the place of God. Now, whether he realized he was doing it or not, that's, that's not really the point. For, for, the point is, for God, you didn't trust me. You operated within yourself, Moses. You operated like you were the one in charge. Man, I can relate to Moses in that. How many times have I not trusted God? How many times have I tried to operate within my own power? How many times have I tried to do it my way? You know, it isn't always about the rules. It isn't always about speaking versus striking. It's about, do you trust me? Because if I trust God, I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. Look at, look at verse 24 there in chapter, in chapter 20. Let Aaron be gathered to his people. For he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Yeah. To fail to trust is to rebel. 
Now, do you see the word that God chose there? Rebel? It's the same word that Moses used back in verse number 10 when he was mad at the people. What did he say? Hear now, you rebels. God chose the exact same word that Moses said. Moses has been blind to a, to a truth, a very harsh truth, and that is that Moses has become what he was hating in other people. God's calling him out on it. You're saying they're rebels, Moses. You're the rebel. You are what you hate about these other people. God's trying to wake Moses up here. He wants Moses to see his failure. But what we have to realize is God rebukes, but God also redeems. And it's really easy for us to look at this and think, man, God only rebukes. And that God is all about consequences. But we have to see this in the larger context of God and, and his journey with Moses. In the short term, Moses is redeemed because he didn't die. Now you, you go back through the book of Exodus and Numbers and you see people who come up against the sovereignty and the power of God and they don't make it usually. They usually they don't last very long when you come up against God in, in that way. So in the short term, Moses is redeemed just because God didn't kill him on the spot. Now think about the first command. You'll have no other gods before me. God alone is Lord. Yet Moses isn't killed on the spot. He put himself in God's spot. And he says, I'm, I'm going to take this on my own authority. I'm going to act like God. But the thing is, this is not Moses' defining legacy. And some of us need to hear that. You know, we make mistakes. We sin. We mess up. We have failures. We step out of line with what God would have us to do. But that doesn't have to define us. It doesn't define Moses, and it doesn't have to define us either. This wasn't the end for Moses. Why is that? It's because we serve a God of grace. God is graceful. He does rebuke, but he also redeems. He's merciful, so he brings redemption. And and here's what concerns me. We tend to take this passage, and we make it all about rebuke. We tend to take a lot of these Old Testament passages, and we make them all about rebuke. And, and, you know, sometimes even in, in the church, we've got people who are all about rebuke. There's not a whole lot of grace. And what does that, you know, that manifests itself in a lot of ways. It's full-page ads in the daily Oklahoma. And it's marquee signs that are meant to, meant to point fingers and, and harm. Now, equally concerning is that a lot of Christianity is all redemption and no rebuke. Uh, I spend a few hours in the middle of the night sometimes with the baby and I'll turn on the TV, and it's on whatever channel it was on whenever I fell asleep. Uh, and a lot of times when I wake up, there's te- televangelists on. And you know what? I can sit there for an hour, feeding the baby, rocking the baby, holding the baby, whatever, and listen to those televangelists. And I can agree with most of what they're saying. Not everything, but I can agree with most of what they're saying. <laughs> but I, I can't agree with what they're not saying. Because they're all redemption and they're no rebuke at all. And, and both of those are, are a lie. All rebuke is a lie, and all redemption is a lie. Both of them are out of step with God. God is a God of both. He rebukes and He redeems. You know, all grace doesn't make any sense, because if there's nothing wrong with me, why do I need God's grace? And, and all rebuke is wrong, because it just paints God as a God that is just, he, he's just a judge. Just, he, he doesn't love people. And both of those are out of step with God. Both are a lie. So we receive the rebuke from God, But we also believe that he has brought redemption to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have to be awakened to the fact that we've tried to take the place of God ourselves. We get out of step, just like Moses did. And and what we need to know is that there is a higher authority. And and when we do wake up to that fact, we receive God's view. We we, we realign ourselves. We receive that rebuke and we go, "I, I understand now that there is a sovereign God. I need to get more in step with what he would have me to do. Now, We have to know that this is not where the story ends for Moses. Moses continues to lead the people. We can go over a couple of chapters later in Numbers chapter 20. There's a battle going on and Moses is still the leader of the Israelites. In fact, Moses leads the people all the way up to the promised land. And centuries later, there is a prophecy that there is going to be another prophet rise up like Moses. And he's going to begin to lead God's people. Now that man came, and he was fully God, and he was fully man. His name was Jesus Christ. He leads his people, he teaches people, he performs miracles, 
He did so many things like Moses did, only he did them better. And one day, Jesus takes three of his closest disciples up onto a mountain. And this is the passage that Cole read for us a while ago. And then all of a sudden, just like with Moses and Aaron, the glory of the Lord appeared. Except this time it wasn't from, uh, it, was, it was coming from one of them. It was coming from Jesus. And the two, New Testament says he was transfigured. Now, I, I don't know what, I mean, I, I can't tell you what that means. It, just, it says he was transfigured. Now, he begins to shine like the sun, and he was radiating light. And in all of this sudden, in this moment, in God's glory, there are a couple of people who appear with him. And Luke chapter 9 says two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. I think Cole's version said decease or death. I can't remember which one it was which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So Moses is in the promised land. Moses has made it to the promised land. And, and, and just like in life, he's talking to God like one man would talk to another. And he made it in a better way than he ever could have imagined. But not only that, did you notice what they were talking about? His departure? They are talking about Jesus' departure. When the text speaks of his departure, or his death, or his decease, whichever version you're looking at, you know what that word is? In the Greek, it's Exodus. Now, you go back to the book of Exodus, and it is the book that is talking about Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. They are exodusing out of Egypt. They're departing out of Egypt into the promised land. And so they're, they're speaking on this mountain about Jesus' own exodus, his own departure. And he's going to have a better exodus even than Moses did. He's going to be leading people out of slavery, but it's the slavery of sin. And he's going to be leading them into an even better promised land than what Moses was able to lead them into. So how does Jesus do that? What's going to happen at Jerusalem? Jesus, the innocent one, is going to be placed on a Roman cross. And he's going to be found guilty even though he's not found guilty. And he's going to be treated like a criminal. And he's going to take the sins of the world on himself and he's going to die on that cross. But three days later, he's going to have his own exodus. He's going to have his own departure. And he's going to leave that grave. And when he does, he frees us from the fear of death. And this is what Jesus was headed for. Now the Apostle Paul picks up on this metaphor later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And... Uh, this metaphor back from, from Numbers chapter 17 and from Numbers chapter 20 about the rock that brings water in the desert. And in verse 6 there of Romans chapter, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says these are examples. And he's talking about the children of Israel. And what he says is they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, that came later, and that rock